It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is my friend Lucas Miles, and we're going to be discussing his brand new book. Honestly, I think this could be one of the most important books of 2021. It's called The Christian Left, How Liberal Thought Has Hijacked the Church. Lucas, it's always an honor to speak with you, my friend. Welcome back to the show. Sean, thanks for having me. Always great to see you and uh, definitely good to be on the program. Well, Lucas, I know you're going to be brand new to some of my listeners and some of my viewers. So let's go that same place we probably went in a previous interview. And that's by having you share a little bit of the Lucas Miles origin story for somebody meeting you for the first time in our talk today. Give them a little bit of context. What do they need to know about you? Yeah, so I, I started preaching at 17. Um, I planted a church. My wife and I planted a church when I was 24. Uh, so I'll be 42 this year. We've actually been at that same church this entire time. It's been about 17 years. Um, and uh, based in South, outside of South Bend, Indiana, very close to the University of Notre Dame. Um, I uh, probably, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, I also fell into uh, kind of uh, the filmmaking world, media industry. Uh, there was a girl at our church that was on American Idol, um, second season. And uh, long story short, ended up managing her career for a while. Um, and that ended up leading to, uh, you know, shooting music videos. And eventually I did a film um, that I co-produced uh, with a producer up in Michigan named Joe Paul Reisig uh, that uh, was called Rodeo Girl. And we ended up selling that to Netflix, uh, Redbox, you know, Walmart. Um, and I immediately started my own film company. So I still pastor. I still write. Uh, I own the film business. And uh, so every day is a little bit different in my world. Uh, and usually where media, entrepreneurship, and kingdom work is, uh, is centered, that's where I like to be. Well, I, I, I follow you on social media. I've known for you for several years, and you certainly don't sit quietly waiting for something to happen. You, you're, you're taking the Christian media space by storm. Uh, you've got a couple podcasts as well. Yeah. Name drop those. Yeah, so I should probably mention those. So, yeah. to. <laughs> so I, I, I host the Lucas Miles Show, which is on Faith Wire and Edify Podcast Network. Uh, I've interviewed some of the biggest names in Christian media and and really, you know, media in general. I mean, everybody from Mario Lopez, Jim Caviezel, Sean Hannity, um, uh, uh, Devon Franklin, um, you know, uh, Kathy Lee Gifford, a lot of Candice Bure, uh, a lot of others. Um, and then I'm a co-host on the Church Boys, uh, which if you haven't heard it, it is, a, it is a train wreck of a podcast. But man, do we have a good time. Uh, I co-host that with uh, Billy Hollowell from um, uh, Pure Flix and then also Chris Field from The Blaze. And we hover around the top 100 to top 150 uh, news commentary shows in the country. And we really look at current events through uh, sort of a faith and humorous lens together. Um, and it's uh, that that drops weekly, uh, typically on Friday mornings. Well, we all need people to help us wrestle with culture and apologetics. How do we respond as Christians? So if you haven't yet listened or subscribed after this is done, head over, get subscribed to the Church Boys podcast. I don't think you'll regret it. Uh, next, let's get into the story behind the book. You're a brave man for taking on this topic. Uh, you know, often we enter into writing contracts and move in a direction before we know what is going to be happening culturally when the book lands. So in terms of why, why did you get on this path? And talk to us a little bit too about the divine timing. Oddly, I can't think of a better time for your book to be hitting the market. Yeah, as we were talking a little bit uh, pre-recording, um, you know, I really had in my heart to release this book uh, before the election in 2020. And I was kind of bummed when I just knew we weren't going to get there and COVID happened and there was just other delays. And of course, the election, you know, itself just, you know, had such an extended season to it with all the, uh, you know, the questions surrounding that. And um, but but man, God knew what he was doing, you know, more so than we did. And it does. It feels like just a perfect time for this book. Uh, as you mentioned, the book is called The Christian Left, How Liberal Thought Has Hijacked the Church. I actually have a copy right there. So um, and it's. uh <sighs> This is this has really been a couple years in the making. I started about two years ago. You know, sometimes people write books that are on current events. They see the current event and they you know lock themselves in a room for three weeks and they crank out this book. Um, you know, I, I I wish I had that you know kind of uh, energy to do that. I, I'm more of a longer writer and and looking at something and researching and and it I think it reads more like an epistle than it does um, you know a, a Christian inspiration book or something. I, I really. Um, you know, I'm always careful with words like this because so many people, you know, it just creates um, these preconceived I ideas. But I, I think that the book is really, for me, intended to be sort of apostolic in nature. Uh, I think this is um, a book that is really addressing what is going on, not just in the church, but also in our country 
as the left really attempts to hijack Christianity, hijack spiritual language, and even hijack Jesus. I mean, we've seen Jesus, just the name of Jesus used to justify everything from critical race theory to socialism, Marxism, um, you know, and, and violence in the streets, you know, burning down buildings and things like that, you know, because Jesus flipped over the tables at the, you know, and, and, and so I think there's a lot of questions in people's minds about, you know, who, who really, what is the real gospel? How does this, how do we make sense and contextualize all this in, in 2021? And um, how do we address some of the rising kind of progressive ideas and liberal ideas that are showing up in the church, uh, the endorsement of the LGBT community, um, uh, uh, you know, things like, um, uh, you know, this sort of socialist, you know, social justice, you know, sort of gospel that we're seeing. So I, I really want to provide a roadmap back to what I call Orthodox Christianity and, and help the, uh, uh, the readers kind of navigate um, their own local church and the greater, broader, you know, Christian conversation. Next, I'd love to have you maybe give us a, a little bit of a, a longer context for how we got here. I feel like for many people, they, they feel like all of a sudden, you know, what we would call, and maybe you can explain when we use the word Christian or the term Christian left, what we're referring to. I feel like a lot of people are like, what happened? This just popped up in the last 12 <laughs> to 18 months out of yeah. nowhere. But in reality, if you follow a lot of conservative commentators, social commentators, this has been a slow build for many, many years that got us to kind of the, the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will, within the past 18 yeah. months. Yeah, I mean, I, I could make an argument that this is 2,000 years in the making, uh, certainly <laughs> um, certainly 300 years in the making, in that, uh, you know, I've traced this back to the 1700s is really where I, I begin my focus in the book. And so, you know, if somebody's, if somebody's a student of history or they love, you know, reading history, especially church history, they, I think they'll find this book very fascinating uh, because I go through a lot of these kind of accounts that have helped get us here. Um, but but you're right. I mean, we've seen this acceleration in more recent years. In in decades past, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, I think that Christian the Christian left was there, uh, but they were more confined in an academic circle. And so, uh, you know, what do I mean by the Christian left? The Christian left is really this this growing constituency of believers, and at times, so called believers. Um, at, to use political language, believers in name only. You know, maybe. Uh, that have uh, embraced leftist thought, liberal ideology, and oftentimes Marxist theory. And I think that um, over time, uh, as I mentioned, these individuals were mostly confined uh, within an academic world within Christian higher ed, uh, but it trickled down from the professor to the pastors, and now it's in the pews. You know, if you're if you paying attention to some of the you know things like Christian Post or Faithwire and these other publications that are out there, you know, there's a recent story I believe it was about Azusa or excuse me, Seattle Pacific, um, that their faculty uh, just um, basically I think it was like 75 percent of their faculty um, uh, took a vote of no confidence in the in the uh, college board uh, because the board voted to you know, really, um, you know, continue to stand on a biblical view of gender and sexuality. And so this is a Christian university. People are choosing not to go to a state school because they want to go to a Christian school that's got Christian values. And I would love to tell you that this is the only school that this is happening at. Uh, you know, Seattle Pacific is probably has a, a, a little bit more reputation of being, you know, more left than other Christian universities. Uh, but this is something that, that Christian higher ed is facing, you know, across the board. There's a lot of challenges there. But it's also happening in our churches. You know, uh, we're, I'm in South Bend, Indiana. It's a blue county in a red state. You know, if you were to come here, I could drive you around, you know, probably within, I don't know, four or five block radius. And I could show you probably five churches that are flying, you know, Marxist, you know, Christian socialist flags in the front, as well as, you know, rainbow flags, um, you know, sometimes higher than they do the cross. And, and uh, you know, this is, uh, I think it's epidemic within the church. We've not known how to deal with it. Uh, and I think we're also seeing the state, you know, historically, the, the state, you know, specifically the left, you know, anytime that there's, you know, a, a Christian who prays in Congress or Senate, you know, you hear the left just erupt with, you know, with separate, what about the separation of church and state? In actuality, the left does not want the separation of church and state. They want a church that is subservient to the state. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to bring, you know, here. And it, it, we've had other times in history where this has happened. I look at the Medici's during the, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, basically kind of the Italian Renaissance, as well as, um, you know, even even um, 
uh, you know, we see this at Tower of Babel, you know, where where the state and and the church sort of, you know, so to speak, and it's a little bit anachronistic, but sort of combine. And, you know, you can also trace this into, you know, Nazi Germany. I mean, you know, Hitler, um, you know, during the Third Reich, they were they were removing, you know, crosses and replacing them with swastikas. They were re- removing the Bible, replacing them with Mein Kampf. And I think that um, this this same it's sort of this soft totalitarianism that's building in the U.S., and it's trickling down, and the church oftentimes has become a mouthpiece of the state's progressive agenda. And I think that if Christians don't pay attention, um, that you know Christianity as we know it in America won't be recognizable um, in another generation or so. I think the next thing I'd like to have you comment on is kind of that blessing and curse of the highly shaped and curated media and social media. I, I, mm-hmm. I feel like last year especially, we saw a very controlled conversation online in terms of what you saw, what you encountered. Um, You could put two people side by side, one who's very conservative, one who's very liberal. And we had completely different experiences on Facebook or Twitter, uh, wherever you might be. So on the one hand, I feel like that's one of the interesting phenomena, especially of this past year. But also, as we all got separated from each other, we were worshiping from home, we were distanced from our brothers and sisters. Uh, we also got to be loud and proud on social media, weighing in on the cultural conversation, saying what we believe. And I think last year, especially, and as we've continued into this year, we were shocked by what some of the people we sat next to in the pew, or maybe the cushiony seats, depending on which church you go to, um, <laughs> you know, people were kind of, I was going to say, spewing that puts a negative con- connotation yeah. on it. Um, what they're sharing online, we're like, oh my gosh, that's like antithetical to a Christian worldview. So yes. we got we got shaped news, shaped social media, but then people are sharing stuff online. We're like, oh my gosh, what 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 in the world has yeah. has broken or shifted? So just uh, I guess the the question I'm trying to ask is how how has media and social media in the past two years basically shaped this conversation mm-hmm. or impacted this conversation? Yeah. Yeah, and that's the the question I get asked a lot is, um, you know, have we experienced this before? And my answer is yes, sort of. You know, so yeah, I can I can show you Nazi Germany. I can and positive Christianity is what they called it, uh, positivist uh, Christendom uh, or Christentum was the, the the term, and it's basically this positive Christianity, this form of Christianity where all the divinity of Jesus was stripped out, all the all the heaven and hell references, all these things. It was basically Jesus, the great social organizer, um, you know, the great servant for the state, uh, was sort of the message that was proclaimed there. We're seeing that again. Um, and so, yes, we've gone through this before, but it's never had the opportunity to be accelerated the way that it has in the past because of, uh, you know, the, the explosion of, of media and social media. And, and so the ability for individual posts to go viral, you know, a few, I don't know, weeks or a month back, there was the, uh, the viral video um, by the, the pastor, I believe it was, a, a, you know, a clergy identified as a homosexual who was talking about how Jesus was racist. And that, you know, um, the woman who, uh, you know, Jesus made the, the comment to of, you know, that, uh, um, uh, you know, basically that, uh, you know, she, she made the statement about, you know, even the dogs, you know, will kind of get the crumbs from the table and, and sort of, you know, he said that, you know, this woman was, was speaking truth to power and that Jesus backed down and repented and this sort of thing. And, you know, most people, unless they really are a student of scripture and they're, politically savvy, they have no idea how to respond to that. And social, they see these things on social media, these videos go viral, and they sound very convincing, you know, yet Mikhail Gorbachev, you know, those who are old enough to remember that name, um, you know, said he was one of the first to say that Jesus was the first great socialist. Well, that made that made newspaper headlines, but that didn't reach every single home. Now we have the ability for a TikTok video or an Instagram video to really go viral at another level. And, and we have kids that are becoming indoctrinated to these things that have never read the Bible, but they're getting what they, they're getting knowledge of the Bible from social media. And it's really a, a form of, uh, of propaganda if used improperly. And so this is one reason why I think we have to get, you know, this is outside of the conversation that my book is about, but it's one reason why, you know, the, the power of big tech matters and why we need to really reel that in a little bit so that we can maintain that we do have freedom online and that that ideas are treated freely and you know with a with a sense of equity uh, um, you know and or rather you know equality in how they're handled. 
Well, if uh, next week the Christian left had a parade in my town, uh, what are the banners they're going to be yeah. carrying? Yeah, you know, uh, each movement has their causes, their buzzwords, the things that they would try to draw us into to uh, get us to start marching in that parade. What banners is the leftist parade going to be carrying for the church? For sure. So um, a couple things. It's it's, uh, it's important to understand that when we talk about the Christian left, that we're talking about uh, really a version of Christianity known probably more uh, commonly as progressive Christianity. Now, to, you know, uh, Bible believing, you know, Christians or people that maybe lean a little bit more fundamentalist, they're going to go, well, we shouldn't even use the word Christian to describe them. They're not Christians. And there's a there's a point to that. Uh, but the reality is this is how they this is how these individuals identify themselves. So if we're going to talk and, and really describe what they're doing and what they believe, it's I think it's important we utilize language that they use, you know, so that we can understand it. And so progressive Christianity has really evolved over time. And it is um, it is it is really based upon biblical this this uh, uh, um, uh, we'll call practice called biblical criticism. And now biblical criticism is not all bad. It sounds like a very, you know, uh, kind of negative thing, but it's basically the the uh, um, the study of going through scripture in a critical way to figure out the who, what, where, when, why, the context, the the language. Um, You know, if it's if it if the the tools of biblical criticism are utilized by a faith filled person, there's all such all sorts of great things that you can learn and discover. Um, but as the name sort of implies, a lot of people use it critically in more of a deconversion uh, type of method. And that's what's happened with progressive Christianity. The other thing to kind of get to where, you know, your question is about progressive Christianity is it's important to realize that progressive doctrine does not have a destination in mind. So what is, you know, this is why you hear people say, well, today's Democratic Party is not my grandpa, my grandfather's Democratic Party. Well, to some degree, it is and it isn't. It isn't in the fact that the, the, the focus of it is completely different than it was then. But what is the same is that there is a progressive view to it. And progressive, uh, uh, the progressive view causes it to always be in motion. It's, it's, like, um, it's like trying to take a picture out of a car window that's going across the country. You know, if you take a picture every hour, no one picture is going to look the same versus a car that is parked and you're taking a picture every hour, it's going to be the same general scenery, you know, with maybe little shifts of the camera movement and these things. Uh, that's the main difference between progressive ideology and conservative ideology. You know, conservatism is saying that we are planted on, you know, especially for us as believers, Judeo-Christian values on a biblical worldview. And we are looking at the landscape from that place that we are, are really uh, rooted in, in, our, in our perspective. And we're going to view the world from here. Progressive ideology says, just floor it and we'll figure it out as we go, you know? And, and so the things that they would have on a flag yesterday are different than the things they might have on a flag today. So today, what do the flags say? You know, it's it's probably things like, you know, obviously a rainbow flag, you'll see that. And there are Christian socialism parades or there's Christian left progressive Christianity parades. You know, there's a big push for, um, for uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, this adopting sort of this progressive view of gender and sexuality. Uh, so, you know, churches that would only do weddings for, um, you know, uh, uh, weddings between a man and a woman are not willing to consider, you know, marrying uh, same-sex couples or, uh, you know, um, sexually diverse couples in this. Uh, that is viewed as, as uh, um, that's not woke enough. That's, that's archaic. Um, you'll even hear statements from people saying that, you know, that as Christians today, as progressive Christians today, they have a better vantage point on truth than even what Paul or Jesus had. And so, you know, that if Jesus was alive today, he would be in agreement with a lot of these things. But because he was in his time period, he was limited to the first century knowledge. And so, you know, we're a little bit more woke than Jesus is today. That, that's literally verbatim, you know, almost statements that you will hear, you know, from individuals. Uh, of course, you're going to see, you know, things about critical race theory, you know, whether that be kind of a Marxist BLM flag or, you know, other sort of markers just indicating, um, you know, uh, trying to separate people based upon, you know, based upon race. And, and I think that there's some great individuals that are standing on on biblical values and biblical Christianity that are handling that conversation really, really well. You know, I think about Ryan uh, uh, Bombarger at uh, um, uh, uh, Radiant uh, Foundation, uh, Radiance Foundation. 
uh, and then also uh, Every Black Life uh, Matters with Kevin McGreary uh, and uh, his co-founder, Neil. They're doing some incredible stuff in that space. But but I think that, it, you know, additionally, kind of a socialist sort of view, you know, it's sort of the uh, a progressive Christianity rally doesn't look much different than an AOC event or a Bernie Sanders meeting. I mean, it's, it's very, uh, it's whatever's in vogue for the progressive ideology today, which might be different tomorrow, but they're going to, they're going to celebrate what they have today. Well, people uh, will inevitably think we're throwing stones at the left. So uh, if we look further uh, on down the continuum to the right, is the right absolutely right? Or are there <laughs> some constructive criticisms for the right as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I address this in my book. I mean, this is not, uh, this book was a book, you know, really based upon um, uh, trying to help people find their way back to biblical Christianity, Orthodox Christianity. My focus is much more on on figuring out what the early church did and what Jesus taught than it is on, you know, what red or blue are doing. Uh, this is not really a Democrat or Republican thing. Uh, there are, I, I know, you know, Republicans who have embraced a lot of um, uh, progressive views of their theology. And th if they would probably be horrified to know that they've embraced progressive views, they don't realize it. Uh, some of the extreme sovereignty mindsets that people have are actually a leftist view of faith. It's, uh, it's they have created sort of this socialist economy within God's world, uh, where he's sort of, you uh, um, uh, you know, it, it's almost like where, you know, you see the left, you know, kind of training people to be dependent upon the state um, and, and really codependent upon the state. We have a lot of Christians that I would say are codependent upon God. And that's something that requires probably being broken down a lot more because people go, well, how can you be too dependent upon God? Well, the way that you do that is by asking God to do things that he has first asked you to do yourself. And so there are certain things that God that we rely on God for, and it's, it's a big list. Uh, but there are certain things that God has invited our partnership and our synergy in, and and I it is actually it is actually wrong of me to take those things back to the Lord and to try to you know coerce Him into doing something that He has in fact called me to do myself, and that involves personal responsibility. And this is a big part of it. The left and progressive ideology, you know, anything that sounds like personal responsibility is something they run from, and and certainly. Um, you know, any sort of conversation regarding like things like original sin, heaven and hell, repentance, you will never hear a Christian leftist talk about those issues because there really is no such thing as sin within progressive Christianity. It, it's, it's a non-issue. The only sin is maybe being white or, or you know, uh, having a biblical, uh, what they would view as this archaic kind of hold upon a scriptural biblical ideology. Uh, those would be sin because they, they're not woke enough for the Christian left. And so uh, it's interesting. Now, what's the problems on the right? The right's got plenty of problems. And so, you know, uh, before anybody thinks this is, you know, right wing propaganda, um, we got issues. And, you know, I've said before, like the church really needs to get its house in order before we just start throwing stones at people outside of it. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, my, my, you know, is, are there things I'd love to change about the left? Sure. But I'm more concerned about those that call themselves Christians. If there's somebody who's just a politician who doesn't really have any interest in faith or Christianity, I don't really have an opinion of that. As a, as a Christian, I'm not here to judge them. My only desire is to be an ambassador for Christ, to lead them to the Lord. But the moment somebody starts saying, this is what Christianity is, and they start defining Christianity in this way, um, that's where we as believers have to speak out to be able to help sort through this. So the, on the right, I think that we've made a lot of um, interesting alliances um, over the last election cycle specifically and with the, the Trump administration. And I voted for Trump, you know, both, both terms. Um, but, but I, from a church standpoint, I'm concerned about some of the allegiances that, that uh, the right has made, because I think that that's going to creep into the church too. And I think we have a lot of angry conservatives that are out there. And, um, you know, I like how Mike Pence said it of, you know, I'm conservative, but not angry. And I think that's a great line. And, and so I want to make sure that as we, you know, stand upon these biblical values and ideas that we're not um, you know, tempted into some sort of uh, cycle of what I call in the book of worry, anger, and apathy, and living in one of those emotions. So uh, that's something I'm looking for. And then also some of the just the meme culture and insult culture, this retaliation, you know, and you'll hear Christians say statements like every, every Democrat's a demon rat, you know, 
it's not a helpful thing for the conversation. And although I understand their frustration, I understand their concern when they see people that call themselves Christians and yet don't stand up for, say, the sanctity of life, um, you know, and, and they're, you know, supporting pro-choice politicians. I understand why that would be frustrating. It's frustrating to me. But I think there's a different way to deal with that that doesn't strip people of their dignity as an individual and still allows you to maintain your Christian witness as you deal with these issues. And so uh, I think that that's important. And, and I'm hoping that this book gives people tools, conversations, questions, and, and to some degree, I mean this in a philosophical sense, arguments uh, to be able to help them um, navigate some of these issues in a way that still retains their faith and, and doesn't cause them to... Uh, uh, you know, I have to throw that out the door to be involved in the conversation. Earlier, you had mentioned uh, on the left how kind of the, the banners, the flags they carry, that changes as they progress down the path. Those things shift, too. I feel like one of the things that's been shifting constantly this past year is what does love mean? What does it mean to love? What is loving? Um, and so the, I feel like that definition changes day by day. How did Jesus define love? I, I feel like that might be a good place for us to go yeah. to get some context for that. Yeah, so um, and you're right. This this definition has changed day by day. That I think the left's view of love right now is that you don't, unless you agree with me, you don't love me, and that love is viewed as agreement. But I think what we see in the ministry of Jesus, and you know, this is what you know the uh, first chapter of of First John says, is that that Jesus came in grace and truth, and and I think that love. Um, is embodied in the, uh, we'll call it the, the paradox of grace and truth. Um, you know, for me to offer grace to somebody, but no truth is really a lesser form of love. Likewise, for me to offer truth to someone, but no grace, it's going to come across very judgmental. Um, Jesus found a way and really, I think that the love of the Father is manifested by offering grace to his children and at the same time, truth. And I think the love that we're seeing, this sort of mis misorientation of love on the left, is a love that oftentimes is, is, has this sort of form of grace. It's really, just, uh, it's really just acceptance. Grace isn't even the right word for it. Um, and, and, but very little truth. And that the, the truth in the left's mind is just that, you know, you be you, you know, you do whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter. And, you know, this isn't about behavior. I mean, I, I'm very careful in this book and, and in my conversations about it. I don't, I don't want anyone to hear in what I'm saying that the left is, has this depraved moral and that the right has this perfect moral. We have issues. I mean, there's people on the right that have just as much sin in their life as people on the left. I mean, you know, the Bible says that we're, you know, we're all fallen, that we're all, uh, you know, sinners in need of God's grace. And so it's important to realize that this isn't, you know, this isn't me standing up and saying, if the left would just be as, as holy and pious and righteous as we are, there wouldn't be any problems in America. Um, you know, it's really about what do we believe? And I'm less concerned, you know, I have to be careful how I say this, but hopefully this will come across right. I'm less concerned about somebody's behavior and more concerned with what they believe. Because I believe what you believe will eventually shape your behavior. And, uh, but what we're seeing is we're seeing a, a downgrading of the Bible in such a way that certain, you know, I, I kind of joke that you have to read the Bible with, uh, you know, if you're a Christian leftist, you have to read the Bible with whiteout in order to end up at some sort of, you know, progressive doctrine, uh, because you would have to cross out a lot of verses and a lot of ideas in scripture and truths in scripture uh, to arrive to some of these things. And so I'm concerned that, you know, uh, when I see a Pew Forum study that says that only 24% of the church uh, believes that the Bible is the infallible, you know, word of God. Um, and that what that means is that 76% of uh, church going Christians believe the Bible is something less than the word of God. And we are seeing, I think this really, uh, um, very prevalent in this leftist, you know, progressive, you know, Christianity. And in terms of upholding biblical values, so you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, was it Mike Pence and I'm conservative, but I'm not angry. Uh, I feel like one of the major shifts we had to go through last year was, seeing our values questioned like never before, but also if we're going to stand up for biblical truth and values, it's going to cost us something. If we are the nail that sticks our head up, that hammer might come down on us. Yeah. And I, I feel like a lot of people have never actually had to face that. So this is the first time many of us here in the West or in the States are, 
are getting an inkling of persecution. And so we're like, oh my yeah. gosh, what do we do with that? Yet, uh, you know, we're at this interesting pivot point where we're going to have to choose if we're if we're going to stand for truth and our faith means something and there's a solid foundation that we're operating from. Well, we're going to have to make a choice to put that out there. But also, that's actually the answer I would argue that culture needs. So there's there's a lot at stake, and and I feel like we're being given the opportunity to actually stand for something. Maybe many of us for the first time, like never before. But you're going to have to choose to stick your head yeah. up, and you might get whacked. Yeah. How, how how do we make a good choice in that situation? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, what I've kind of tried to let try to lead people to in this in this book, where I'm taking them is is a look back at I think some of the early Christians. You know, I'm just I'm infatuated with first century you know Christian writings and. And, and uh, you know, really from, you know, scripture all the way to probably fourth and fifth century with Augustine. I mean, that's where I, I, I rarely read a book that's newer than, you know, 1500 years old, you know, kind of thing. Dead people and, don't let you down. So, you know. yes, yes, <laughs> this is true. And so, you know, one of the things that we see in this is that there was a different level of dying to yourself and self-sacrifice that the early church was really able to embody. And so much so that they they took just a joy in persecution and not the way that we see today where somebody you know you know takes a jab on twitter at somebody else and they fire back and they go oh i'm being persecuted you know i mean i'm talking about going like it would be an honor for me to go before someone who who you know hated god and manifest the selfless love of god to be able to show them that i won't i won't falter in my faith i won't turn away and that i will pray for them and i'll, I'll have you know we see jesus prayer of you know father forgive them for they know not what they do and we see really stephen in the book of acts kind of model something similar to this and look i hope that persecution at, at any sort of you know significant level never touches america's shores and I'm I'm not I'm an optimist. Like I'm not writing this book because I don't think the church is going to make it through it. We know that God wins in the end. I do. That doesn't necessarily mean that Christianity in America is always going to thrive. You know, I believe that the church around the world can never be silenced. That if it if you you know uh, strike it down in one place, it's going to grow in another. Uh, Tertullian said that the death of the martyr is the seed of the church. And I think that you know if if Christianity in America is sort of extinguished in some way as we know it. Uh, that will eventually create a revival because people will see the persecution and they will respond. Um, you know, I've gone through, you know, minor episodes of what I would call persecution. I've actually been assaulted three times at churches. Um, I was, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, one individual is just a deranged individual that we were doing some counseling with. And, and I've had, uh, um, you know, two other times, one was in uh, inner city, St. Louis, another time at a, uh, um, at a Native American uh, reservation in North Dakota. Um, and some some older teenagers thought it'd be a good idea to come up behind me and strike me with a rock about this big in my head and knock me out and, uh, um, you know, continue to laugh as they did it. And, you know, but look, that doesn't hold a candle to what people are going through in the Middle East and China and these sorts of things. And, and you know, I... I would do all that stuff over again if it meant that I had the opportunity to share the message the way that I did and to be able to have joy for the Lord. And like, I'm not angry at anybody. I'm not mad. Uh, I understand that the world doesn't recognize the gospel. They don't recognize Jesus. We're here to try to help them recognize him, to be ambassadors for this message. It's not about, this isn't about politics. This is about, is the Bible true? Is this our foundation? And as Christians, the answer should be Yes. I never get worried that the world doesn't have scripture as its foundation. I don't need all of America to say, you know, that they're, that scripture should be their foundation. I, I need the church to say that. And I think that we need the church to say that. And so my hope is that this book, you know, points people back to really a, a unity despite denomination founded upon the supremacy of Jesus and, and the infallibility of the word of God. And that we return to biblical orthodoxy in such a way that it is um, it, it settles some of these disputes and arguments that we have that are just based upon these sort of in vogue, you know, cultural uh, uh, momentary phenomena. Well, last question here before we wrap up, you know, this kind of an interview conversation, this kind of a book, uh, definitely we're going to attract people who went through some hard times last year. Uh, many of us woke up one day and discovered our church suddenly decided it was woke or was for all these different causes that we never knew we were all super passionate about, but there it was. And people, you know, throughout last year and into this year, they're having to choose, do I stay part of this community? Do I make a difference and speak truth in that community? 
Um, if I hit my head against the wall enough times, do I shake the dust off my feet and go fellowship elsewhere? Uh, again, kind of in that whole persecution vein, a lot of us have never had to quite face that exactly before. So, you know, for the person who woke up one day and says, wow, I'm, my, my church seems to be very progressive or woke or left-leaning, um, what, what would be your encouragement? How do they process that and yeah. make the best decision for themselves and their family to move forward? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I would say that, you know, to do stuff slowly, and I don't think that that means months and months, but I think it means at least having a conversation about things. Uh, as a pastor, um, you know, I've had plenty of people leave my church, come and go over the years, and it's always nice when you have a conversation about it, where it's not just like you wonder if they're ever coming back. Especially, you know, if you're visiting someplace, I don't think you need to have a formal meeting with a pastor. You know, you go and try out the next place. But if you've been attending someplace for a while and you're starting to grow uncomfortable with what's being there, it might be the conversation that you lead that ends up helping the pastor kind of come back to his senses, you know, and you might find out maybe there's pressure from the board or pressure from the denomination, and he might want to know that there's somebody else out there that supports him. And so I actually give some questions in the back of this book, The Christian Left, that, you know, to really sit down with your church, your pastor, or even to self-evaluate your own, you know, ministry or your own Christian life. And, you know, I call these things the canary in the cage, so basically how the church views gender, sexuality, you know, abortion, how they view, you know, some of the race conversation, you know, what does that look like? And, and, and I think that, you know, when we start seeing these real extreme kind of woke progressive views in this, um, I, I think that those are, those are reasons to realize that there could be something more toxic in the, in, in that, you know, establishment that you might want to look at beginning to move your family elsewhere. Um, if if it's maybe just a comment, you know, not every pastor that's, you know, had had, um, you know, maybe f succumbed to some of these stories that we see or some of the social media pressures that are out there doesn't mean they're a leftist because they struggled to respond to one situation or they didn't know how to handle a particular news event. Um, but we want to look for what the trend is. And and I think that uh, uh, ultimately, we want to also know how do they feel about the Bible? You know, even seeing something as simple as like, does your church still offer an altar call? Is there a chance for anybody to get saved? You know, because I mean, one of the one of the doctrines of progressive Christianity is is typically universalism. You know, in this this view that all people are saved, they just don't know it, and you know, kind of all roads lead to God or through the cross that everybody was saved, doesn't matter what they believe. And and so, if your church never gives a time for people to get saved, then um, I think that that should be that should be you know at least a sign to begin to ask some questions, and there's also a spectrum here. You know, we have still kind of a lot of people that are part of what I would call the emergent church or emerging church, and and then that and we have kind of full on woke leftist churches. The emergent church is sort of like that gateway into the Christian left, but doesn't mean that everybody tipped over yet. And so the emergent church is more about asking questions. And the problem is a lot of times those questions never got answered, and eventually it led to doubt and unbelief and sort of this deconversion experience that the Christian left goes through. Um, but I think that, you know, if we catch somebody early enough in their questions, we might be able to help them arrive back to biblical solutions and biblical answers. And I think that it's important that we have these conversations. And so certainly anybody that wants, you know, if they got specific questions about their church. I love engaging with people on social media and it might take me a minute to respond. But, you know, please shoot me a message on, uh, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it is, and uh, would love to, uh, you know, discuss those things. Yeah, I love your perspective of at least slowing things down, because when we're emotional, we're angry, we're all the things, we just want to bail tomorrow. Uh, but being willing to at least initially have a posture of giving your leadership team, your pastor, maybe fellow congregants in the church, the benefit of the doubt. If these are yeah. people you've been doing life with for years, you obviously have some common ground if you've been friends and in the same church family for a long time. Uh, and also, if you're going to sit down and take the step of having a conversation with your pastor, allow them to help you understand where they're coming from or the pressures they've been facing. And, you know, maybe you'll end in that place where it's it's time to part ways. And if so, well, take that step and, you know, move on. But if you don't actually give your pastor, the leadership team, fellow congregants, whatever it might be, the opportunity to at least dialogue you and to understand and be understood, you're really doing a disservice not only to them, but to yourself, because you're always going to wonder that's going to be a part in your story where like you just bailed and went. And, you know, maybe it all could have been prevented. Like Lucas said, maybe you asking questions and having a dialogue, maybe that will actually pivot and shift the direction. Yeah. Uh, you don't know unless you take the chance. It might be a little nerve wracking, but be bold. It's a time for bold moves. Go go ahead and do that and see what happens. God might open up something completely unexpected that you didn't think was going to happen. Uh, Lucas, tell us what's the, what's the drop date for the book? Yeah. Where can we order it? 
all the things we need to know to help you get the word out about this important new release. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Amazon's got the book listed as a May 4th release. I think most people it's shipping uh, to them probably by May 6th. Uh, the book is available right now on my website. If people want an autographed copy, uh, they can head over to my website. It certainly supports me as an author more so if you get it from my website. Uh, and the book is called The Christian Left, How Liberal Thought Has Hijacked the Church. And any copy ordered through my site, I'm autographing as well. Uh, so I uh, would love to uh, get that out to people. We're shipping right away. Um, and then, yeah, if they want to find out more, sign up for my mailing list. There's a place to do that on my website at lucasmiles.org. And like we do with every episode, we'll have links in the show notes places where you can connect with Lucas and pick up your very own copy of his new book. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Lucas Miles. Once again, our book today was The Christian Left, How Liberal Thought Has Hijacked the Church. For more on Lucas, the book, all the things, head over onto, excuse me, for all the things, head over to lucasmiles.org. And Lucas, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been an honor. It's been a pleasure to have you back in the show. Thanks, Sean.